and uh, to thank you first for to invite me. This program is very well, really uh, put together, and uh, I think uh, it's actually global the program, but we are going to situate Asia in that global program. And this is what we try to do this afternoon. People who are absent today, two or three women, also extremely uh, knowledgeable on this subject, I think we'll have to make up for it. Yes? We can. Women are empowered to do that, yes. Okay. So with that, what I will do is to, I will just say two minutes something on the subject and Asia. On the subject, I want to say that we cannot put economic, social, and cultural rights of women in one basket because it is not one basket. It's not only three baskets, but 30 baskets. And therefore, we must examine it individually, properly, what are economic rights, what are social rights, what are cultural rights. In fact, in every area of life, women are doing worse and worse and worse. And we have to know why. The other thing I want to say is about Asia. Asia is one of the continents in, in the world in which, with which we deal is not homogeneous like Africa. We can say Africa, 55 countries, and many things in Africa are common. Latin America, similarly, not all, but some. But in Asia, none at all. It's a, it's a continent where there is no homogeneity at all. There are 27 countries and almost all the religions of the world. In passing, I'd like to tell you that in fact, most of the religions were born in Asia, which is also an interesting point. I'm talking before Christianity. Of course, there were other religions before Christianity. In case you are under the impression that before Christianity, no religion existed, then you'll be wrong, because you'll have to go to Asia, because all the seven religions of the world actually originated there including the Abrahamic religions, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. There are other religions, but this is not the subject that I'm going to talk about. The reason why I mention the religions is to show that the societies and countries in Asia are actually multi-ethnic, multi-religious, and multicultural in the true sense of the word. It's not that we are living in a Christian country and then say we are multicultural. It's not like that happens to be those countries are actually multi-ethnic, multi-cultural. Now the point is that what we have to remember before we go into the subject is that we have of course two very important people on my left and right, but I'll just take one minute to introduce Asia and then give the floor to you. One minute I want to take on Asia is to perhaps bring to your attention something historically you might like to consider and that is, no longer economic power rests in this part of the world. In fact, economic power is shifting underneath to Asia. Economic power, not nuclear power, economic power. And this is important to remember that in fact, apart from India and China, which are very interesting development models and democratic, democratic models, we might may have very many points on it, most of the countries in Asia do, do not have what might be called governments which have believed in one theology, theology or the other. In other words, secular. Most of them are secular, some of them are not. But you must look at that for Asia in, in a sort of with a multi kind of prism to understand what kind of subject we are talking about. Now, as far as women is concerned, there's nothing we can generalize in Asia except perhaps the fact that most Asians are non-white. <laughs> apart from that common feature, <laughs> apart from that common feature, <laughs> there's nothing common. <clears throat> what I'd like to say about the two development models which are just now currently being followed in Asia, one is the Chinese model and the other is the Indian model. We can discuss it, we can uh, analyze it, but before we do that, I'd just like to tell you that women, no matter which model of democracy, no matter which type of government, no matter what kind of theocracy, women seem to do not very well. 
which shows that there is no one particular government, one particular theology, one particular religion which supports women's uh, uh, freedom of human rights. This is important to remember. So we are really talking of something completely, completely uh, uh, in, in, a, in a sense where women are struggling in all countries in Asia and in all countries of the world. One more point to situate Asia, which makes it different from Africa, Latin America, and perhaps European countries, and that is that because of the fact that the majority of the countries of Asia became independent recently, that is to say the 1960s, like some countries in Africa, most countries which became independent adopted new laws. This is an important point to remember because of the simple reason that the new laws in Africa and Asia are in fact more advanced than the laws in Europe because the European laws were Napoleonic laws and therefore what affected women was Napoleon 18th, 19th century which is not true of Asia because the majority of the countries being independent adopted new laws. So that point we might like to remember in the background when we talk about women and perhaps later on, if there is time, I might like to add one or two things. But I have great pleasure in being with you this afternoon and trying to look at this subject as neatly as we can. And I give the now my floor to the person the right or the left. It's nothing to do with politics, right? So I give the floor to my right. Please. Please. Uh, new axis of progress in effective implementation of economic and social, social and cultural rights on women. And coming from Lebanon and uh, working for the Palestinian human rights uh, organization in Lebanon, so I will be uh, precise in what I will present in giving examples from this country and from the situation of Palestinian refugee women. So uh, it will be uh, like uh, from from the field and not uh, not, not for all the Asia as well. Uh, it's true, actually, what uh, uh, President uh, you have uh, just mentioned about what what controls uh, women's rights, and if we are going to look at economic, social, and cultural rights of women, uh, we cannot really think about that they are in one basket, they are in more than 30 basket, and also what, what affects women's rights are, uh, there is several dimensions that affects women's rights, and speaking here about three major uh, areas, we are talking about the laws, we are talking about the culture, and we are talking about religious. In, uh, in one, one of the, if we are going to talk about a state about like uh, what, what progress the state of uh, of Lebanon, for example, have made in the last three decades with respect to women's rights in in Lebanon. We can mention that there is much that has been improved 30 years ago till now, given the fact that Lebanon is a country that have came recently, like 10 years ago from uh, 20 years ago from. Uh, the civil war. So we have the war that controlled the country for a long time, but also we have the post-conflict area, uh, the post-conflict period that was not uh, real. That there were no efforts actually in, in these 20 years since 1990 till where we are now in order to build the community on a human rights basis. Not only for women, but for for the uh, for the community in in general. We are talking about a community that is controlled by sectarian balances. So we we have several villages in in the country, three at least. But we have different sects in these three uh, uh, three religious groups. We end up having 18 sectarian groups in Lebanon. And when we come to personal codes or person, uh, personal codes, for each sect we have a personal code. So we have 18 different personal codes in the country. And here 
the main challenge for women starts with the personal goals because there is no civil code in the country, so any personal affairs have to be uh, managed and directed through these personal goals and in relationships that are mixed, we have the major uh, conflict that happens at, at this sphere. So this is one major challenge and one major struggle for women in Lebanon. And in, in, in this in this part, the, the civil the civil uh, the, uh, the the religious codes that we have and the religious courts that we have uh, and that control the uh, the, the the lives of. Uh, uh, of, of, of people. This is one, one part when we are talking about laws. If we take the other parts of the laws, we find out that, for example, on the level of, uh, 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 of penal codes, we find out that rape is considered a crime in, well, I'm still talking about, about Lebanon. So rape, which is one of the main violations that take place against women, we find that it is a crime. However, if the perpetrator of rape uh, offered to marry the victim and the parents approved or like the victim agreed under the pressure of the community or under the pressure of her family, uh, which is based on, on cultural factors, then we find out that the perpetrator will not, will not be sentenced under this, uh, this, this law. So even with, with the uh, harsh violation against women, we are talking about rape again, uh, we find out that there is excuses that are given by the second circuit that I've highlighted, which is cultural pressure. And uh, uh, here, like, what religious is the, for what religious the perpetrator is, it doesn't matter because we come like to the circle of of uh, cultural pressure and how the community uh, preserved. There were several campaigns in, in the country to change these laws and to, uh, to, to address rape as a crime and to, to take out this condition if the perpetrator offered to marry the, the victim. But so far we, we haven't succeeded yet under pressure of uh, uh, religious uh, figures and religious courts, uh, uh, preserving that like this condition will protect the family and will protect the community, uh, but there is no consideration for what will be the status of, uh, of, uh, of the women who are victims of, uh, of rape. The third thing, I also believe that we will not have Socio, uh, social, economic, and cultural empowerment if we didn't have political empowerment for women. And this is like the, these two areas are complementary to each other. And uh, still, until very recently, the campaigns are, st start, again, are continuing on having parliamentary quota for, for women engagement in, uh, in, in the parliament and also in public life, but still this is under the high political pressure and uh, there is no willingness actually within the country itself to, uh, to engage women according to uh, uh, international standards, so ge the gender equality is, is not like in the, uh, in, in the thought even of the politicians who are controlling the, the country. And we believe that this is a major failure of the state if we want to speak about any improvement for the socio-economic and cultural rights for women. If we do not have the political empowerment, we, we are talking about a big failure. Uh, a, a very, uh, I, I don't like to talk and uh, to say that it is a good example, but it's one of the very famous examples that I want to give about uh, a woman who wanted to uh, enter to the municipal elections in Lebanon in the last uh, uh, period that was in 2009. She wanted to, uh, to go to, to, to be involved in the municipal elections and uh, she wanted to enter in the campaign. Actually, there are two examples that I want to highlight. 
The first example was her husband didn't allow her to put her photo uh, and to publish this photo on, uh, on, uh, uh, on the streets. So he put his photo and under it, it was written, elect the wife of this person. <laughs> this, is, this is one, and, and it, was, it, was, it was public and it, it was in the streets. And, uh, and this was very strange to have it in, uh, uh, in such an op open, you know, what is known about Lebanon, it's like a, an open country, uh, if we compare it like to the countries in the Arab uh, region, uh, or in the Middle East, and in the Arab countries in the Middle East and North Africa as well. Uh, Lebanon is really well known about being like a free country, about having uh, uh, freedoms of expression, uh, but with these practices we come up to, uh, uh, to a place to, to, to tell that this stereotype is not, uh, is not a true stereotype about uh, the country. The other example, within the same, uh, within the same uh, elections, the municipal elections that took place in 2009, <coughs> We had a woman who succeeded actually in, in winning the elections uh, in, uh, in the north, northern Lebanon. In, uh, I, I guess like it was like a, a near Tripoli. It's not like the central uh, city in uh, in the north. So she won the elections, and she was the only woman in a municipal council of twelve persons. So the head of the municipality had a dinner and invited all the members to his uh, to his house. So everyone arrived, when she arrived, he said, like, you can sit with my wife. And then the municipal members, uh, the, the <laughs> council members, who together with him went to the other direction inside the house, and they, they stayed together. She, she told him, like, but I won, and I'm invited not, not as a friend of you or a friend for your wife. I'm here because I'm a municipal council member. And he said, but... Uh, uh, we, how we are going to, yeah, you will be the only women sitting within the, uh, uh, with like 13 men and this would be, uh, this is not acceptable as well, despite that she won. And uh, uh, this shows like, we are talking about 2009, this shows like the, the, the mentality, uh, the masculine mentality in, in the community, it's not only like on the municipal level, this is like one example that we are giving at, at this point. With, without having those that criminalize violence against women, we will not be able to talk about social, cultural, and economic empowerment. Economic empowerment is very important for women, but how we are going to address women and how we are going to, to, uh, uh, to organize trainings, to organize campaigns, to involve women in, in, these, in these actions, when we, do not, we, when we do not have laws that criminalize violence, domestic violence against women. And the very recent actions we had in Lebanon on that was that, when I'm saying very recent, that means a couple of months ago, one of the discussions that was in the parliament regarding, or like the parliamentary committee that is discussing the uh, law to criminalize domestic violence, they take everything about, yeah, everything was taken out from the draft that is referring to women. And then the whole law turned to be like criminalizing violence within the family. So there is no specific attention uh, from the parliamentarians uh, who are studying the law and who, will, uh, who supposedly want to pass it in the, uh, in the upcoming sessions in the parliament. This was totally, uh, totally changed. Uh, in, uh, in the draft and saying that when we are talking about the whole family, we are talking about, about women, uh, uh, women in the family. But we believe as activists, we believe that if we do not have anything that is precisely on domestic violence against women, then we are very, very far from, uh, 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 from what, we are, uh, what we want to achieve on uh, uh, women's protection or gender equality or any of, uh, of, uh, of these uh, areas. Uh, uh, well, another, uh, another example that I wanted uh, uh, to mention uh, is related to, uh, uh, to to refugees. 
we are we are talking about about uh, no actually before Matthew coming to the refugees then I want to conclude on on women in Lebanon mainly by saying that uh, the state that does not see yet a woman as a full citizen of the state there is a shortage then in evaluating or even in looking at the woman herself as a human being. One of the, one of the main failures of, of the state uh, is, uh, is by, not, by not considering Lebanese women as full citizens of the state. And this is, uh, could be entitled by having uh, or having a law that, that say uh, a, a Lebanese woman can pass on her nationality to her children and uh, to her foreign children or to her foreign husband and foreign children. This is another uh, tense and hot debate in the country since six years now and uh, we've developed a lot through the campaigns in Lebanon. Uh, uh, women uh, rights uh, organizations and women based organizations in the country and human rights organizations, a very big campaign about uh, nationality women uh, Lebanese women to have the right to grant nationalities to their foreign husbands and children. And there is very, very extreme examples about what violations uh, the children and the husband of this woman are facing uh, to, to an extent sometimes to deport them from the country because they didn't, for example, renew their residency or, or giving the fact that there is no reason why they are residing in Lebanon. It's not enough to tell that my mother is Lebanese to, to, to reside in this country or like we are here with my mother and uh, we are going to schools in, in Lebanon. This, is, this was really extreme examples that we have witnessed uh, uh, across the previous years and I believe that if we are going to talk about, about state achievements in, uh, we should really begin from do states consider women uh, full citizens of, of, its, uh, 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 of this country, or do states consider women human beings at the first level and they have the same and equal rights with men in, inside the, the community? This is a major question that we really need an answer to it from, from our governments. Uh, I, I gave examples of Lebanon because it's the country that I'm residing in, but if we came to other countries in uh, in Asia, or if we came to, uh, we, we find out that this is, this is quite similar, like having, for example, uh, uh, Kuwait that came recently uh, uh, to have like women start to practice their right to vote. Uh, it was only a couple of years ago, and this was, this was an achievement for, for women. We having like uh, women in Saudi Arabia who are still struggling to drive their own cars. This is a major struggle that we, we have and here we come again to the three circles that I've highlighted at the beginning. Laws, culture and, uh, and religious as well. So these are the main three circles that we have to put our efforts in working on, on them. So we have to change, we have to raise awareness as well because only, I, I believe that raising awareness is one, one of the main efforts that everyone should be putting forward because through raising awareness, through education, we can achieve a change. Uh, because people have to know first. The people who have been raised that this is not allowed in the name of religious, they will continue practicing this. Or beating women in the name of religious, they will continue on practicing this. But once they know that, no, this is not what religious say, and this is not allowed, and this should be punished as well, they will stop. At one place or another, they will stop. A, a, a second example is refugees. Because there is a high difference from when a woman is a citizen of a state and when a woman is a refugee in a state. And having like the status of, uh, or holding the status of refugee, this is one of the main factors that make you marginalize more than other categories. So women in Lebanon, 
I believe that they are highly marginalized because of the factors and the examples that I have just mentioned. But having refugee women in Lebanon, this is more marginalization and more discrimination that women will practice, specifically to their socioeconomic rights. Because one example about economic rights is that refugees in Lebanon, there is no refugee law in Lebanon that protects refugees first and that provides refugees, for example, the right to work in Lebanon. So men, men refugees, they will be afraid from going to labor market and working because of uh, they might face arrest, they might face uh, imprisonment and deportation. It depends. Like uh, there is there is major fear of, from men here. We are talking about so uh, there is refugees who are men who go on and they face sometimes like they will not be arrested because they will be lucky or uh, they know like where to work or how to, to organize their, themselves if, if they uh, if they had a, a chance to work. But in refugee community, people who work more are women. And they accept to do uh, low, uh, low labor as well. Uh, uh, and, and because they want like to, to own their living, to survive the family, to help the family. So, uh, uh, and also working in, in the Palestinian human rights organization and with the, this uh, category of, of, of refugees mainly, we came across so many examples and evidences that women who are more uh, 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 workers in the community than, than men, this is, this is one, uh, one area, but they are the lower who are paid. So they are not paid as men who are doing the same job. Uh, they are afraid to speak up about any violation that they are facing in these, uh, uh, in these works that they are doing because they are afraid to lose the job. So they are silent on sexual harassment. They are silent on, uh, uh, on uh, low payments they are receiving. They are silent on additional hours that they have to work on and in all the requirements that uh, the, the owner of the work asks them to do because they want, they are, they want to keep the, uh, the, the job. At the end, we come up to a place that, yes, she is working, but she is suffering uh, as well, and she is not able to speak on what she is suffering from. And if she spoke up, she might face so many other other violations. So here we came, to, we come to a fourth circle that is, uh, who is the other in the community, and how we deal with the other in the community, because we have to see the other first. And when the other is a refugee or a migrant worker or uh, any person who is not a citizen, he needs extra protection through laws first and from the community at, at the second level because if the community has practices of discrimination against this person, so one of the practices is that we don't see this person, we do not, we do not see him or he does not constitute like a major part of our, of our uh, life. And in one of the major discussions of preparing the national plan for human rights, now here we, we come again to the state commitments and what states have to do, is like, for example, Lebanon started to prepare its national uh, plan for human rights in 2005. The, the, at that time, the preparations start or the discussions started. And we came, like after two years, there was high uh, uh, rejection for including in the National Plan for Human Rights any chapters on refugees, on Palestinian refugees and on non-Palestinian refugees, refugees coming from other countries. Two years of discussion or more, three years of discussion, so from 2005, December 2005 we started, until December 2009 we continued in, in these three, three years of discussion until there was an agreement from the Human Rights Committee in the Parliament to include in the National Plan for Human Rights chapters on Palestinian refugees and non-Palestinian refugees, specifically socio-economic uh, rights on, uh, on on those refugees. And here, like we believe that this was one of the achievements of civil society 
because including these chapters in the National Plan for Human Rights was, was a major success for us because then in the Parliament we can start up discussing uh, on what, what laws of protection for refugees, how we can uh, grant refugees their uh, social, economic and cultural rights, be, uh, not, not the civil and political rights because this will create uh, a major problem in the political uh, uh, aspect in, uh, in, uh, in the country. Like this was a major, uh, I, I feel that I guess, cross the time. Uh, so uh, I just wanted to, to share in, in, in what I've said, like a few examples from, from the country. So uh, uh, to, to, for, for us like to know where we are still in, in one of, of the countries in Asia regarding achievements for uh, uh, the uh, effective implementation of socio-economic rights for women. Thank you. I hope it was. Again, two or three points that Rola has mentioned, which are extremely important. One is that uh, when we talk of domestic violence in any law in any country, they like to shift the parliament and others who are making the law, like to shift the burden from domestic violence to family violence. Why to make it broader so we do not actually uh, concentrate on the fact how men commit violence against women. This has happened in many countries and women's uh, organizations and women's rights, we have tried to fight against it. This happened in India, we did not allow them to change the title of the law. Because family violence is much easier to deal with by parliamentarians than uh, domestic violence. Right? So that's one point. The second point I think you made, which is very good, is the quest question of rape as an issue. I'd like to make two points on that. You, how is it that we say that the uh, uh, those who commit rape actually are not really punished in any country. I don't I have I do not know of any country which has made that law. And when this happens, I'd like to know when you give sort of lashes to women or stone them to death or whatever the law might be, primitive all those laws are, how is it that nobody says let's do it to men? Mm -hmm. It's because they are committing this sexual act all the time. All the time they are doing what women are supposed to have done for which they want punishment. So this this kind of thing, I don't know why it is that we, those of us who are educated, see this every day, don't notice it. Why are we not why are we not punishing men for rape? Why are we not looking at the fact why men rape everywhere? Why men rape in wars? How is it? We do not look at this very important question. But as you know, that now in the criminal court, there is an article, uh, International Criminal Court, rape is considered a crime, which is a very great achievement. So we'll come back to these issues again, but thank you, Rola, for raising them. So may I now uh, come to you to talk about this uh, question, which is extremely complicated. And if you could concentrate on the state engagement, what is the responsibility of the state or the government? We heard this morning some governments uh, talked about it, but I am finding it amazing why the governments do not actually talk about what their responsibility is. Yes, we can address this question to you. C'est une tâche très importante et il y a beaucoup de choses à dire sur cela et surtout il y a beaucoup de choses à faire parce que c'est un gain de parler, c'est un gain de, 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 de nous écouter, c'est un gain de discuter ici mais il faudrait vraiment faire, faire quelque chose pour que la situation change parce que la, la situation est, est très difficile. On dit que la situation économique est très difficile dans le monde entier, et alors on n'a pas le temps de penser à d'autres problèmes. Mais ce n'est pas seulement ça. Parce que si la situation économique est si difficile, elle est aussi difficile, elle est surtout difficile 
parce qu'il y a tous les valeurs, tous les principes qui ne sont pas respectés. Et on sait bien que euh, ce n'est pas en disant on ne doit pas s'occuper de la culture, on ne doit pas s'occuper de, 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 de la fiction, on ne doit pas s'occuper des de discriminations et tout ça, de, de, que les choses vont améliorer. Parce que les gens n'ont pas seulement besoin d'argent pour vivre. Et l'argent vient si les gens vivent d'une façon meilleure. Et pour vivre d'une façon meilleure, il faut que leurs droits soient respectés, que chacun de nous soit respecté. Et considérer que les femmes sont des êtres humains aussi bien que les hommes. Ce qui est écrit dans la Déclaration universelle des droits de l'homme, malheureusement, est écrit, mais n'est pas respecté par tout. Et ça n'est pas respecté. Pourquoi Parce qu'il faut changer la mentalité. Parce qu'on dit, les États, c'est que Krishna, notre président, pourquoi les États ne font rien, ne font pas beaucoup à ce sujet Les États ne font pas beaucoup à ce sujet parce que les États, d'après moi, ne considèrent pas important ce problème. Les États pensent, et nous devons considérer une chose, notre société est faite à mesure d'hommes, elle n'est pas faite à mesure d'hommes et de femmes. Et ça, c'est la chose la plus importante. Et les lois sont faites à mesure d'hommes. Et la femme doit lutter pour entrer dans, la, dans le monde des hommes. Et pour, elle doit lutter, elle doit changer, elle doit modifier elle-même pour avancer. Et ça, ce n'est pas juste. Parce qu'en en faisant ainsi, on renonce à toutes les qualités, à tous les principes, à bien des choses qui sont importantes pour le fonctionnement du monde entier. Et alors, moi je dis qu'il faut, faut changer les mentalités. Mentalité. Il faut... Nous savons que partout, comme vous avez dit, en Inde, en Afghanistan, dans les pays arabes, dans la, en Chine, partout, il y a le problème, il y a le problème de la violence, en Italie aussi. Moi, je viens d'Italie, il y a un énorme problème de violence. Nous avons de droit de l'annoncer. Vous parlez de, de, de bien des choses qu'en Italie, on, été, euh, on ne devrait plus avoir, parce que nous avons des droits très avancés en Italie. Mais quand même, les policiers, les juges, partout, même aux écoles, et peu, peu, personne ne les applique, parce que dans leur mentalité, ce n'est pas des choses importantes. Parce que dans la mentalité, parce que c'est la femme qui devrait agir d'une façon différente. Mais on ne comprend pas que ce n'est pas ça. Le problème n'est pas là. Moi, je donne mon association et je travaille pour l'éducation au droit de l'homme. Et nous avons lancé, il y a plus de 20 ans, la, 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 la décennie de l'éducation au droit de l'homme. Et nous avons commencé à faire des cours. Et nous faisons des cours pour la formation des formateurs. Parce que si on ne forme pas les personnes, on n'arrivera jamais à changer. Et surtout, ce qui est très important, c'est de former les femmes. Parce que c'est nous, les femmes, qui avons la possibilité de changer le monde, si nous voulons. Parce que c'est nous qui éduquons les enfants. C'est nous qui avons le, 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 nous soignons les enfants à la maison et nous soignons les enfants à l'école dans les premières années de l'école. Et c'est très, très important qu'on ne transmette pas des stéréotypes, qu'on ne transmette pas de modèles qui n'ont plus le droit d'exister. Parce qu'autrement, on n'arrivera jamais à changer rien du tout. Et alors je dis, nous sommes ici réunis. C'est bien. Faisons, décidons de faire quelque chose pour faire changer. C'est ça que je dis. C'est inutile de parler, de parler, de parler. Parce qu'on sait très bien. Euh, il y a la déclaration universelle, il y a les lois qui ont été changées, il y a les nouveaux pays qui ont, des, vous avez dit, qui ont des constitutions très, très avancées, parce que dans les constitutions, il y a les principes fondamentaux des droits de l'homme. C'est bien. Est-ce qu'ils sont appliqués Il ne faut pas dire droit de l'homme. Droit il faut dire droit humain. Droit humain, droit humain oui. Il faut, changer, changer. il faut changer, parce qu'en Italie, on dit en effet du, du mal, on n'est pas d'autre. Et alors, qu'est-ce qu'on veut faire C'est ça que je vous 
Meu Deus, não dei. Les états, les états devraient plus considérer l'importance des femmes et des hommes, des enfants et des sujets. Il faut penser que nous sommes tous des êtres humains. Nous avons le droit à être respectés et dès, dès notre naissance, nous avons le droit à notre dignité. Nous naissons et nous avons. Mais c'est nous-mêmes qui devons penser à la respecter. Parce que si moi je ne respecte pas ma dignité, je ne peux demander aux autres à la respecter. Mais je dois savoir tout ça. Quelqu'un doit me le dire. Aujourd'hui, les enfants n'apprennent pas ça. Et c'est une autre faute. Et alors, c'est à nous de décider, changeant, faisant quelque chose pour modifier cette situation. Je suis prête à collaborer. Et je voudrais que tout le monde, que, que de cette conférence sorte quelque chose d'important. Aussi, je regrette qu'il n'y a plus que une personne des Nations Unies, mais on pourrait présenter quelque chose, pas une pétition, mais présenter des résolutions pour faire modifier et pour, pour, tout, pour avoir la possibilité de organiser de la formation pour que la situation change. Je vous remercie. Thank you very much for raising some very interesting points. I think one of the points you're raising is that the question of uh, how we respect ourselves, how we empower ourselves, which will then empower women. And the most important point in this empowerment is sort of a game of empowerment. The, the word has become very uh, sort of uh, now, you know, everybody uses it, but what does it actually mean? this question of empowerment. The empowerment question has come in actually since 1994. Yeah, okay. Okay, very good. I'll just make one or two comments and then give you the floor. Empowerment. And empowerment is a very good word now everybody uses it in the UN. But we don't actually understand what it means. What is the source of empowerment? Where does it come from? Is it from the individual? Is it from society? I would like to actually go back to the title of our panel, and that is state engagement. Is the state engaged in empowerment? Now, it so happens, no matter how advanced the law in a country, no matter how well it is drafted, no how beautifully it reads also to women, but enforcement and implementation is missing in many countries. Not only in developing, by the way, also developed countries. So to fashion most advanced laws is not enough. It is implementing them, which is what we really need. I just wanted to bring this to your attention. And then I think we'll then continue. And later on, if there is time, I'd like to make a comment on your, what you said about the refugee status. Yes. Please. Now I think I'll give the floor to my friend here sitting here, happens to be a man, on the <laughs> corner of this table. Doctors of desires. So I don't intend to talk long, besides uh, the reason I actually decided to take the floor is because my good friend David Fernandez Puyana uh, has not been able to come and he has an important message. Yes. As you know, the Spanish Society for International Human Rights Law launched back in 2006 this civil society movement for the human rights peace. At the time they launched it, at the time of the Declaración de Duarte was adopted, by the way, with uh, a very big women component in it. Because, obviously, Peace without women is not. And also international democracy, which is my field. International democracy without women is also not. In any event, now these are obvious things to say, but what I wanted to underline is that civil society launched this movement for the human rights of peace. Everybody thought that uh, they were crazy, or rather that we were crazy, when the Declaration of Luarca was adopted, practically no state wanted to associate itself with us, not even Spain. The 
first state uh, that associated itself with us was Senegal. It was really amazing. And uh, by now, we have a whole slew of states supporting us. 2,000 non-governmental organizations. And we succeeded after the adoption of the Departure de Santiago de Compostela on the 10th of December 2010 to have the council task the advisory committee with drafting such a declaration of the human rights of peace, which was drafted, submitted to the council, the council approved it, and on the basis of this uh, draft declaration, they created an intergovernmental open-ended working group. That was last session. And uh, I assume that in the next uh, three, four sessions, the Declaration on the Human Rights of Peace will be ready. And it is very holistic. Uh, it's very interesting to see that everything is there. Not only what you would expect to see, there. obviously the sign is there. Obviously the prohibition of the threat of and the use of force is there. But also, we're not only concerned with what is regularly termed negative peace, the absence of war, we're interested in positive peace. And in order to achieve positive peace, you have to have harmony. And what does harmony mean? Also harmony in the house, harmony in the home, harmony between men and women. There cannot be the structural violence that exists today in many countries, including the United States, in which women are not only discriminated against, but are also physically mishandled, etc., etc. The problem that I was dealt with this morning of domestic uh, violence is also an impediment, it's also an obstacle to the enjoyment of the human rights peace. And uh, if you read the draft declaration prepared by the advisory committee and approved by the Congress, uh, it is really amazing how rich it is, how all-inclusive uh, it is, and how important it is. Because we always say the human right to peace is the alpha and the omega. It is at the same time a precondition for the enjoyment of all other civil, political, economic, social, and cultural rights. But it's also an end. It's not only the means to the end, but it's also the end. What you're trying to achieve is a peaceful society in which there's not only an absence of war between states, but there is an absence of this so-called structural violence. And structural violence takes many forms. It doesn't take only the form of uh, war, be it civil war or international armed conflict. It is also the kind of abuse that you see in corporations that abuse that you see in uh, the very structure uh, of society. Now, you mentioned quite correctly uh, that uh, we have a semantic problem here. In Italian, you have diritti umani. In Spanish, you have derechos humanos. You don't have the problem, but you do have a crush. Uh, I mean, uh, I think uh, that has been made clear uh, in the Declaración de Luarca and in the Declaración de Santiago that you do need an, a change of semantics because words are very powerful weapons and, and, and words perpetuate stereotypes. Word, words perpetuate a condition of inferiority of women. And that, of course, it takes time. You know, I think we can now, we are trying to say, in the dignity of the woman and not all the nature. That, that's retrogression. More democratic and more equitable. Uh, you have to have a change of thinking patterns. You have to change the paradigm. And in many aspects, you have to change the paradigm. Uh, we have already an inbuilt prejudice against economic, social, and cultural rights because we have this city idea that uh, rights are of the first generation, obviously the important ones, then uh, rights of the second generation, the economic, social, and cultural, and well, you know, are they justiciable? You know, are they real rights? And then you have the 
right to the third generation, environment E, some going and so forth, to that up and then goes to ISIS. And uh, most people, unfortunately, uh, in the rich countries, in the developed countries, uh, are, it's not that they're bad, is that we've just, a habit, been accustomed to talk about first, second, and third generation rights, everything that's been put in a little kitchen hall. And then, of course, we prioritize, so let's do only the first generation rights. And then forget the second and the third. And that simply has to be abandoned. I mean, I've written in my report to the council and to the General Assembly that I would like to see a functional paradigm. I'd like to see a different approach to human rights that looks at it from the function of that particular right. Uh, and where uh, does it come in? And how do you claim it? And how do you use it? Yes. I, 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 so, yes. I just want, I didn't want to uh, interrupt. But the next time you write to the motion, you yeah. otherwise. <laughs> Yes, please do that. So, you know, otherwise, what will happen is that human rights are considered to be human rights, mainly male, male rights. And that's what we have been fighting for. I don't want to remind you what I was with you 10 years ago when we began this question of the rights of peace. And the question of how to bring the gender in the draft of the resolution has been a very big problem, I remember. I don't know how far you have succeeded. And now that you are there, you have to succeed in bringing gender in the paragraphs of the resolution. Otherwise, what's the point of our being here, of fighting, or being well, friends with uh, that? Uh, rest your mind, because it is in the Declaración de Santiago, and it is. But uh, in my approach, as I said, in a new functional paradigm, women's rights and the right to equality uh, come under uh, the, what I would like to call the imminent rights. I have the enabling rights. Enabling rights are, of course, the right to food, the right uh, to development. Those rights that will enable you to enjoy the civil, political, economic, social, social rights. But then there are another category of rights that I would like to call imminent rights or uh, rights, uh, in French I would call them passe-partout, uh, rights that are inherent in each individual rights. And those are the rights, for instance, of equality. Uh, you don't have uh, a privilege. Uh, you don't have rights for men uh, that are higher than the right for women. So every single right will be the right to uh, a fair trial, or the right not to be subjected uh, to torture, or the right uh, not... Uh, uh, no, this will not work. This is, it does work. It is uh, the absence of arbitrariness that is part of this imminent right in everything. And then, as any rights, any rights, mention of course, the right to peace, the right to harmony, the right to the full enjoyment of uh, your rights. Yes? I'm sorry to interrupt you. But I think that this discussion, of course, this may not be the place for it. But, but uh, this may not be the place for it. But since you have the um, really very good position of uh, saying this to the Human Rights Council as well as the General Assembly, and since we are drafting the resolution, I'd like to bring to your attention that if we say they have the same rights women and men have, we'll be difficult for the simple reason that women's specific and special rights are different because of discrimination. And unless we can make that point in the resolution, I think we have to educate the Human Rights Council also. Yeah. They might look very educated, but that doesn't mean they are. OK, uh, just a no, point. No, interesting for the point. simple reason that this point is the something I've been trying to make in the with you also when we have our meeting. We must make this point. Discrimination will come in the way of equal rights immediately. But that requires affirmative action. I mean, no one is opposed to an affirmative action that will place women in the same position as men so that they are not still suffering from the handicap or from the mortgage of centuries 
not millennia of discrimination. So, I mean, that can be worked into it okay. as an element of, uh, of a catching up. May I see you agree with women's rights? Into the drafting, most likely it will be lost. I have some experience of the resolution drafting as well as the ratifications. <coughs> but I do want to appreciate your efforts. And I want to see you again so that you don't forget. <laughs> I <laughs> tell the other no. thing is, but I'd like to involve the participants on this. I'd like to bring to your attention the subject, which is the uh, economic, social, and cultural rights of women. State engagement. I'd like you to concentrate on state engagement. For instance, this morning, I had, I wanted to ask the ambassadors, very eminent ambassadors who are here, perhaps you could tell us what is happening about state engagement in your country. And that would be the right kind of thing just now in our panel. So, the, the floor is open to all of you. I'm sorry that we engaged ourselves on the sideline, but it had something to do with women's rights. Thank you. Please, please. Uh, say something to Mrs. Batran. Um, when you spoke about uh, women having been raped and uh, being forced to get married to their to the men who raped them, I it's not a state engagement, it's a human rights council engagement I'm talking about. We had as NGOs, we had a meeting with uh, the presidency of the Human Rights Council uh, to prepare the last session of the council. And that was just at the time when a young girl of 16 committed suicide because she was being forced by her family to get married to the men who raped her. You remember that? I think it was in February or in March. And so we brought it to the Human Rights Council presidency saying we would like for that matter to be discussed. And the president was really in favor of that. She said we should change the laws, we should do something about it. Well, in June, we waited for that matter to come up, and it never did show up. And I think that when Krishna says, uh, it's a state's matter. Well, I would like for the Human Rights Council to give the example and to be the first one to talk about that matter, really. But it never did show up, and I felt very bitter about it. I noticed. Thank you for the example. Ah, ça y est, vous êtes arrivé, vous avez plus de force dans la main que moi. Merci. Donc, euh, j'aurais voulu faire euh, deux remarques d'abord et poser une question à Madame Badran. Donc, d'abord, la première remarque euh, qui va tout à fait dans le sens de ce que vous avez dénoncé par rapport à la parité. Alors, je tiens toujours à dire, je, je me présente peut-être, Michel Vianès, présidente de l'ONG française Regard de Femmes. Et donc, nous avons fait, euh, bien sûr, les ONG en France depuis 2010, donc les lois sur la parité. Et ce que vous nous avez dit par rapport à ces euh, deux cas que vous avez cités, le, le mari qui me dit que c'est sa femme, qu'il est le mari de la femme qui va être candidate, qui nous a amusés, mais il, ne faut, pas, il faut bien penser qu'en Europe aussi, nous avons à peu près le même cas. Et moi j'ai un souvenir en faisant des débats pour inciter les femmes à être conseillères municipales en, en 1999 et 2000 à Lyon en particulier, où certaines nous ont dit que lorsqu'elles sont allées voir les équipes municipales sortantes, en leur disant, ben nous, euh, moi j'aimerais bien être candidate dans la commune, et vous savez, on leur a dit, mais c'est pas possible, nous ne sommes que des hommes, et après le conseil municipal, on va au bistrot et on raconte des blagues salaces. Donc comment voulez-vous qu'on ait des femmes Donc, pour vous dire que le machisme est partout. Hein, donc, et ne, comme vous me dire aussi. Donc ça c'est la première remarque. La deuxième remarque auquel je tiens aussi, j'ai beaucoup apprécié que Mme Patel ait rappelé que les violences ne sont pas que les violences domestiques ou familiales. Et nous, alors, au sein du lobby européen des femmes, nous parlons de violences masculines envers les femmes. Et parce que les violences ont lieu bien sûr à la maison, elles ont lieu dans, au travail, elles ont lieu dans la rue, et toute la permissivité sociale de ces violences qui est faite par les médias, les images auxquelles nous sommes confrontés, auxquelles nos jeunes sont confrontés, avec des visions totalement archaïques 
les rapports femmes-hommes du patriarcat. Donc je pense que c'est très très important de, de bien nommer, comme vous l'avez dit, et vous allez me permettre alors, de, de faire une petite avancée par rapport à mon intervention de tout à l'heure. J'allais la dédier, comme d'habitude, chaque fois que j'interviens euh, à l'ONU, à Ansameta. Alors Ansameta était l'une des deux femmes, une indienne, l'une des deux femmes qui a fait partie, euh, je dirais, lorsqu'il y a eu les discussions sur, la, la, sur les, pour la, la Déclaration universelle des droits humains, donc elle a fait, avec Eleanor Roosevelt, c'était l'autre femme. Et elle avait beaucoup insisté pour qu'on ne dise pas « droits de l'homme », mais « droits humains », parce qu'elle savait que si on disait « droits de l'homme », la moitié de l'humanité n'y aurait pas accès. Et ceci a bien sûr été totalement accepté et entériné par le truc. Donc je tiens, en tant que Française, à dire je ne parle que de droit humain. Et peut-être, peut-être, profiter de cette réunion, alors là je, mets, je propose à Micheline, si elle veut bien, qu'on fasse une, une sorte de pétition pour demander à ce qu'il y ait au moins une salle à l'ONU au nom sa Meta pour euh, montrer ce qu'elle fait. Et je crois que je suis une des rares femmes à en parler. Et c'est vraiment dramatique que tout ce qu'elle a pu faire à l'époque est complètement oublié. Voilà, donc ça c'était mes petites remarques préliminaires. Et j'ai une question à poser à Mme Vatran. Donc ce qui me paraît, enfin je vous ai bien entendu, et surtout sur le viol, comme vous l'avez rappelé. Mais quelle est votre question voilà. Alors voilà, donc par rapport euh, à ces lois qui existent dans un grand nombre de pays, il n'y a pas que chez vous, puisque dans beaucoup de pays d'Amérique du Sud, il y a cette fameuse loi où lorsque le violeur donc euh, accepte, accepte d'épouser l'enfant, la, la mineure ou l'adulte la, violé, il n'est plus poursuivi. En Amérique du Sud, dans certains pays, ils sont arrivés à obtenir qu'il y ait la loi. Alors, est que, comment, euh, où est-ce que vous en êtes par rapport à ces discussions, par rapport à la loi pour condamner et pour poursuivre les violeurs, quelle que soit euh, la suite enfin, vous sans qu'il y ait de de possibilité d'amender de, de, cette permise. Pour son intervention, parce qu'elle a relevé certains témoignages, euh, pas seulement dans ce pays, euh, elle a touché un peu de quelques pays de la, de la région d'Asie, euh, comme l'Arabie Saoudite, c'est un pratique qui se trouve là-bas. Et ça, c'est bon à savoir. Parce que euh, nous ignorons, c'est vrai qu'il euh, y, y a des pratiques qui se passent dans tous les pays dans le monde entier, même ici en Suisse, et vous ne citez que ça. Mais il était, euh, il était bon pour elle de nous rappeler qu ce qui se passe en Asie, puisque aujourd'hui le thème est dédié à l'Asie. Et je te remercie pour cela. Moi, je voudrais, puisque le thème ici parle de des nouveaux axes de progrès euh, dans la mise en œuvre effective des droits économiques, sociaux, culturels en Asie, que euh, les États ont pris des engagements. Alors, euh, les États ont pris des engagements et qui n'ont pas respecté, tel que nous le savons, euh, dans certains pays, il n'y a même pas un élu. Et dans certains pays, certaines règles ont, été, ont, ont commencé à être respectées. Mais euh, la mise en œuvre effective des droits des femmes dans le monde est critique. Moi, je, je pense qu'il est bon de nous dire, parce que de nous dire quels, quels sont les axes de progrès euh, que l'Asie a eu. Donc, quel est votre, votre avis selon. Euh, les, 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 les engagements des États. Qu'est-ce que vous proposez qu'on fasse aux États pour pouvoir, n'est-ce pas, avoir euh, qu'ils respectent leurs engagements euh, Ça, c'est ma question. Merci. I will reply, of course, in, uh, in English. And as I understood, uh, he was asking what should uh, be done in order to treat or deal with the cases of what, what can be done. Uh, definitely, uh, uh, the case 
conceive of like having the perpetrator of rape marrying the victim, it's not a solution. Uh, because this is, uh, according to studies that have been done and researches with, with women, it showed that like the violence continues in marriage and uh, there is no like, especially there is no psychosocial support that was given to, uh, to, uh, to the victim. In addition to the perpetrator like feels that he, he has done nothing to be blamed for. Uh, on, on the contrary, he was offered. I believe, uh, especially if we are talking about what states can do, I believe that there should be, uh, uh, we should be using uh, 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 pressure on, on states. For example, uh, if we are talking about uh, Lebanon as a case, and uh, as I understand, like uh, you represent uh, uh, European uh, women's uh, lobby. Yes. So there is, there is cooperation between the European Union and Lebanon that is translated in terms of uh, uh, association agreements and there is action plans that have that should be adopted like the second version of the action plan should be adopted in October this year. I believe that these instruments should be used to pressure the countries to change its laws. No economic cooperation to be developed with countries if we do not have a specific laws change. We are not only talking about uh, uh, monitoring elections and uh, uh, guaranteeing that elections will be independent. And no, we have to enter to to this specific areas that that touches every person in in the community. And this will be a great success in terms of cooperation, political cooperation and economic cooperation. Political cooperation and economic cooperation should be controlled by advancing the status of laws and monitoring if the states are implementing these laws or if they are not implementing these laws. And if they are not implementing, it's a failure for the state. That should not be, there should not be like an advancement in the cooperation in, uh, in, uh, in, in that uh, field. Plus, uh, uh, one, one of the, of, of the other uh, things that could be done, uh, we also believe that uh, the status of women in, in Europe, for example, was not as we all see it now, that before there, there was like a massive struggle until we reached places where uh, there is laws to protect women, etc. We have to learn from these examples. We have to, to have like exchanging experience, uh, experiences and, and not only just like by taking delegations from one place to another to hear stories. We should uh, have forums where women can speak about their experiences to each other. Uh, in, 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 uh, we've, we've worked a lot with refugees and we find out that when we trained women to speak up on, on their uh, cases and how, because of our support, not only as an organization, but civil society support, they advance and they, they overcome their suffer. They become very good tutors for other women, not like by putting flip charts and presentations and very well organized uh, uh, places for conferences. No, it's just by bringing women to support each other in, in that area. And I believe this is, this is one, uh, one, one of the support that is essential and that also should be recognized in, in, in projects as well, like projects uh, these days, this is one of the things that is also compelling for civil society in, in working because projects have to be designed in specific matter when sometimes you have, you come up with results, sometimes you are not able to sustain what you come, uh, 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 what, what results you came to and you build on these results, sometimes we are not able because of the high bureaucracy in dealing with uh, uh, the way like we design our uh, work because this is the only way that it could be designed. But I believe that there is very successful and important examples about women who overcome their suffering and who can be very good tutors for other women in, uh, in, in, inside the community. Uh, as for uh, Micheline's uh, question, it was about what the state should uh, should do in terms of uh, advancing uh, because uh, advancing the, the 
women's rights. Uh, uh, as, as I mentioned in, in my presentation as well, states first they have they have to, to see that women's rights uh, are are important as important as other rights in in, in the community. So it's not like to, to to just give up discussions on women's rights under saying that it's not a convenient time or we have national priorities because in, 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 in Lebanon, and especially when it comes to Palestinian refugees or like in the Palestinian refugee community, women have to, to continue educating, like doing the national education and raising up their children on the right of return and we will return to Palestine, etc. But what about their life? It's forgotten under national priorities. Everyone, uh, they say that it's not the uh, it's not the important thing to address now. Even it's just like a, a, a simple example. There is one of the networks that has a gender working group. None and like in this network, there is a number of Palestinian NGOs that are members. None of the Palestinian NGOs applied for the gender working group. Because what is more important for them is Palestine, Israel, migration and asylum, refugees, uh, uh, justice. This is where they find themselves. And it was like a very major question by the network. Why none of the Palestinian NGOs applied for gender working group? Because uh, also gender mainstream, how we can mainstream gender in our work. I can work on, on, on uh, 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 national education, <coughs> but I should do that also from a, a gender perspective as well. So I believe oui, that... Oui, je voulais savoir, euh, en tant qu'ONG, quel est le rôle que nous allons pouvoir jouer auprès des États on, on, on states. But because when we're talking about states and we're talking about governments, like, uh, it's, uh, we're talking about, about, about the laws and how to effectively implement and enforce the laws that exist and amend those those that need to be amended to be based uh, gender based. So, exactly anti discrimination and gender gender based or gender oriented. So this is what states should do, and international international cooperation with the states should be addressed in that direction. Either you do these amendments, or there will be other procedures that that should be taken. For example, we will not increase uh, uh, staff or economic cooperation, as I mentioned before, uh, in terms of, of anything that can, because uh, at the end, it's, it's money what, what is important for, uh, for the states. And uh, it, it's, it's one of the areas that we can use in order to pressure them. Yes. Thank you, Rola. Incidentally, talking 